So, um, hi, um, I'm hi. Irv Cal, and I'm here to talk about my new book, Object-Oriented Python. It's just been published by No Starch Press. Um, I'm very proud that, that it's out. It just came out in uh, January. So I've, I've worked in software my entire career, and I've written code using object-oriented languages for 25 years. And for the past 11 years, I've been teaching software development at two local universities, at uh, UCSC Extension in Santa Clara, and at Sil University of Silicon Valley, which used to be Cogswell College in San Jose. Um, and for the courses that I teach, I develop my own curriculum. Um, and I've taught an introduction to programming course for many years. And more recently, I started teaching an intermediate level object-oriented programming course. And when I started the development of my uh, OOP course, I did a lot of research about um, books that were out there to try to, to see if there was one that was appropriate for my course. And what I found was that most people who wrote books on object-oriented programming um, they introduced all the, all the keywords, the class, instance, variables, methods, and polymorphism, all right at the beginning. And those are all very important terms, but it confuses a lot of students to be thrown uh, all these terms right up front. In the other books, I found uh, that they talked about object-oriented programming in just a few chapters. So it's just kind of an, an afterthought. So I decided to create my own curriculum um, and this book is an expanded version of that curriculum. So I teach this course at, at both of my uh, different colleges. So the book starts off um, uh, assuming that the reader has a basic understanding of Python and can write small to medium-sized programs using the basic Python constructs. Um, the book starts with examples of procedural coding and talks about the problems that you run into with procedural coding. Then I introduce object-oriented programming style and I show how it solves those problems. And we recode those examples in an object-oriented programming style. So I start with physical things like light switches, and dimmer switches, TV remotes. Um, and then I use object-oriented programming to build a bank with a collection of bank accounts. So the Python language is purely text-based, but I wanted to use a, a new approach. I wanted to explain things in a very visual way. So I decided that the Pygame package um, was the right way to do this. And if you're, not, if you're not familiar with Pygame, it's a free downloadable extension that allows Python developers to build programs with a graphical user interface. So the book goes through an introduction to the Pygame module, explains how, how event-driven programs work. And then um, I introduce a whole bunch of graphical user interface widgets written in Python, things like buttons, text input fields, text output fields, animations, each built as a class. And the book provides a package called PigWidgets that I talked about in my uh, last talk. So let me show you just the, the first demo program. Uh, let me share the screen here. So this is, I'm just using idle to, to run stuff here. So these are, are all things that are available through this pig widget package. So um, Pygame doesn't have any of these things built in. So I had to build my own uh, buttons, uh, text buttons and custom buttons and input text fields uh, and output text fields and draggers and radio buttons. All these things are available. I've built all these things for my students so they can build projects. Um, I can rotate and do different kinds of crazy images, all that stuff, draggers. So all these things are available through the package that I built. Um, then the book uses the, the pig widgets package to, um, uh, I lost my place, I'm sorry. It uses the pig widgets package to introduce the three main tenets of object-oriented programming, uh, encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance. And we build small video games to demonstrate each one. So here's an example of one of those things. So this is a little um, balloon popping game where you have different types of balloons and it uses inheritance and it uses um, polymorphism to send messages to all the different balloons and you keep track of scores and there's one of my buttons. So we build these different programs. It's a very visual environment. <laughs> so 
then the book goes more into um, the last part of the book goes into video game design and development. And it introduces a, a second Python package that I wrote called Pig Helpers. And this package contains things like timers and dialogue boxes and a fully object oriented framework that allows you to build games and applications with a number of different scenes. And the book uses a program called Dodger, a game called Dodger, uh, that demonstrates this. So something like this, where this is a, a splash scene, and then you can um, start to play the games. So this is a different scene. You have to avoid the red guys and grab the green guys. And then when the game is over, you can you can go to a high scores screen, shows the different stuff that you can do. So all the framework is there for you, and it's all very object oriented. Each scene is a separate class. And in the um, in the final chapter, I touch on the concept of design patterns, I, and I go into one of them. I go into the um, model view controller design pattern. And I use this little dice rolling program. This is going to roll a bunch of dice, and then you can see the output in a bunch of different ways. So we can roll the dice, and I can show it as a pie chart or bar chart, as a pie chart, as text. So it's the same data being shown in, in different styles, showing the MVC pattern. Um, so the book shows you where to download the code for all the listings in the book. It also explains the two modules that I developed are available on GitHub. Uh, they're also they're downloadable using PyPI. Uh, so all the code is available, and you can, in fact, you can use the Pig widgets and Pig helpers um, packages without the book. That, that's fine. I also want to thank um, Monty Davidoff, who I met here through Bay Piggies. He worked as the technical editor for the book, and the wording and the code examples are much better because of him. So the book is available right now through Amazon um, and through the publisher's website, nostarch.com, uh, and through technical bookstores everywhere. But I do want to mention two more quick things. Um, first one is that I, I teach courses at UCSC Extension, and those courses are available to the general public. Uh, there's a new version of my recorded version of the, of the course, the object-oriented programming course, starting in April. And the last one is that in my spare time, I've been working on the development of a new game that's built using all the stuff that I talk about in the book. Uh, it's, the book doesn't go into this game, but the, all the stuff that I talk about um, is built into this game. So I, I used to work at a company many years ago called Convergent Technologies. And this is my version of a game that ran on the Convergent Technologies computers, um, but it's written in, from scratch in Python and it's called Rats or Pi Rats. And this is all placeholder art. There's, I, I don't, I'm not an artist, I don't play one on TV. Uh, so it's all really bad art. But the basic idea is that you are in a maze and the maze is interesting because it wraps both horizontally and vertically. So you can never get out of the maze. And the object of the game is to kill all the rats, uh, but the rats are being made by rat factories. So the maze is generated on the fly. So you have to walk around the maze and find, I don't know where the first factory is, but you have to go, oh, there's a rat. So you have to go find the, uh, the factory and then you have to, there it is down there. You have to shoot it uh, a couple times and, and kill the factory. But meanwhile, the rats are still multiplying from the, from the other factories. So you have to walk around the maze and kill all the, uh, kill all the rats. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's, it's a much more complicated game than it might, uh, than it might seem. There, I'm shooting, some, I'm shooting one off screen. And if you die <laughs> like that, I just got killed. You show up somewhere else in the maze. And one of the other little features of this is that in addition to the rats, some of the rats are pregnant and they give birth at random times. So I just wanna see if I can find a, uh, a baby rat here. Um, of course, now in this demo, there are no baby rats being born, but they're all just completely random. Uh, <laughs> So you can shoot and move in eight directions and the rats can only move horizontally or vertically. But it's actually a very challenging game. It's hard to, uh, 
it's hard to kill all these rats. The baby rats are very small and they're much harder to kill. Well, there are some in the game here. There's one up there. You can see this little baby rat over here. Uh, there we go. Anyway, that's the game and that's the book. Uh, that's it for me. Great, that was really cool. So I've got a question, is that, um, do you think that book would be appropriate for kids as well? Um, if they're smart, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And is, um, absolutely, I think it would be fine. I think it'd be you know more like a teenager type thing. I don't think it would be right. for um, maybe middle school, but uh, right. But I use it in my college courses, and that works fine. But I think um, high school would be fine. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Let's do it. And Irv, that was awesome. Uh, that book looks so cool. And another shout out for No Starch Press. All of their books are absolutely top notch quality. So, you know, I have no doubt that Irv is an absolutely top notch author. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, without any further ado, let's go ahead and share my screen. Uh, do you guys see an IPython notebook right now? Yes. yes. Sweet, okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this, is, this is in preparation for my PyCon talk. Um, and we are going to be talking all about GraphQL tonight um, and why I think it's the devil's API. Uh, alternative naming, uh, how I learned to stop worrying about the data loader. Uh, quick shout outs before we get rolling. Uh, I really want to thank Tatari for this. Um, I am a serial procrastinator and the only way I was able to do this is because they let me do it during work. Um, <laughs> here's my, uh, some of my information down below and also a quick plug for a uh, meetup that I run and uh, one, of the, one of the members from the meetup that, that I run here tonight as well, uh, which is the Homebrew Learning Club. We get together and do uh, different sorts of uh, learning activities with math, data science, um, computer science, uh, things like that. We're pretty open to, uh, to, to new, new gatherings and new learning. Um, all right, let's get rolling. So what the heck is GraphQL? Uh, GraphQL is two things. GraphQL is a query language and an API. Uh, GraphQL exists to be a sort of replacement for the more traditional uh, like RESTful API. Um, and it exists to be much more verbose and discoverable um, and sort of intuitive. Uh, and it allows users to um, sort of explore the data and, and connect it as they need rather than as the API has determined, right? Uh, so it's very flexible. So uh, to, to say it better, uh, when I was thinking, it's a, <laughs> a descriptive structure for our API. And uh, that descriptive structure, uh, by nature of being self-documenting, replaces all those swagger docs who swear 99% up to date but are really closer to complete disaster. Um, we, can, we can see a, a sort of very simple uh, GraphQL query here. Um, so we have a query name, which I'm calling Dan Brown novels. That's just for... Uh, for your own use, you can call it whatever, you don't have to have a name at all. Um, and then we're going to traverse down through, through nodes of our graph. Uh, so author is a node, uh, books is a node, um, and then books has some attributes on it like title and is demonic because it's a Dan, Dan Brown book, of course. Um, these, these nodes can be connected, uh, they can represent a lot of different relationships, one-to-one, one, one to many, many to many. Um, and just because we traverse this graph in a, uh, in, in a method that would say that the, the underlying data is in a graph database, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, also, uh, just a quick heads up, if there are any questions as we're going along, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to chime in and interrupt me. Um, I'm not keeping an eye on chat because uh, I have a pretty small screen. So uh, going on to the API section, uh, that, that query language needs to hit something on the Python side. 
Um, and this is what that, that Python side looks like. So we have a class, which we call, I, I like to call a QL class, uh, a query language class. Um, and in this example, we're gonna keep it easy with SQL Alchemy object types. This one is going to relate directly to a model. Um, generally, every, every node will relate to, directly to a database model, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to. They, they can be totally um, you know, made up things. They can be uh, stitched together like a view. Um, in this case, uh, it's gonna be related to the Lamborghini model. Uh, the interfaces, this is just kind of some boilerplate. Uh, this is going to be the state of, uh, the state and the context of uh, this node. Um, we can have attributes on the class. This, uh, this right here will pick up all of the attributes that are actually in the SQL Alchemy model. Uh, this is just an added attribute. We can add attributes on top of it, just like we would in a normal class. Um, the only difference being that we have to then say, you know, tell GraphQL, like, what the heck do you do when somebody calls this attribute? And we do that by resolving it. Um, the pattern for that is that the, the method name is resolve underscore the attribute name. So we have resolve underscore is Diablo. Um, and it just returns, you know, is the, is the vehicle model Diablo? Any questions so far? Excellent. So quick pit stop. Uh, we're gonna talk about the GraphQL package landscape uh, and kind of what you need to get rolling with this. Uh, so the way I see it from the sort of, you know, foundation up, we need to start with the database. Um, that's where we're going to pull everything from. We need an ORM to get information from the database into our API or, or into rather our backend layer. And then we need a GraphQL lib to allow our backend layer to communicate with the actual uh, portion of the API that's being exposed to GraphQL requests. Um, the database for this one, we're using SQLite. Please don't use that in production. Uh, that'd be a silly choice, uh, you know, unless you like to live on the edge. Um, for our ORM, we're using SQL Alchemy. Um, it is, in my experience from a couple of companies, uh, the absolute industry standard. Uh, it's not without its faults and it is, can get quite complicated, uh, but I do have another talk on that. Check out my GitHub. Uh, and I have, a, I have another whole presentation on setting up SQL Alchemy and, uh, and your models. Uh, PeeWee is another option for a, a sort of lighter weight ORM. I haven't used it. I don't know, maybe next presentation. <laughs> um, for our Python GraphQL libraries, uh, we sort of have two main ones. Uh, there's this one, which is pronounced Ariadne, uh, which I definitely didn't have to look up a YouTube pronunciation video for, uh, and it's apparently referencing a character in Greek mythology. Uh, this is the one that is being developed by Apollo, who is the sort of front runner right now in the JavaScript like requester side of this, uh, this GraphQL landscape. Um, but it, it seems a little bit newer. There's not many contributors, uh, not quite as many stars as what we're going to use today, which is graphene. This is sort of the uh, the industry standard. Um, it is really easy to pronounce and named after a super rad game-changing material. <laughs> uh, we got we got seven point one thousand stars and a whole ton of contributors. It's a lot of a lot of movement on this, and it seems uh, very stable though poorly documented. <laughs> All right, let's make an API. Let's start with our models. Uh, I wanted to run through this just so everybody has a good idea of what we're dealing with. They're going to be really simple today. Uh, we just need to make a quick hierarchical model. Um, so our sort of top of the hierarchy, or I guess bottom of the hierarchy, is going to be our company. Uh, this is going to be our largest model within a company. Uh, each company will have several departments. And each one of those departments will have a bunch of employees. So we can see our, our foreign key relationships to department and department ID. Uh, likewise, we can see the relationship to company with our company ID and our company relationship right here. Perfect. Okay, 
So let's make a GraphQL schema. This is going to be, this is going to be the difficult part, um, but it's also going to be pretty impressive. Uh, you can be, you, you can represent a lot of information on the GraphQL layer uh, very simply if you don't need a lot of customization. And that's all thanks to the SQL Alchemy object type. Um, this does a lot of the heavy lifting, does a lot of the wand waving, and it's pretty magical. Ooh, and it's gone. That's how magical it is. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So we have our company QL, we have our department QL, we have our employee QL. These are the, uh, the different models that we're representing. Um, these are all going to be inheriting from our SQL Alchemy object type. Uh, that means that they're going to interact directly with our models. They're going to have um, context around the, the attributes that are in the model. Um, yeah, pretty much, pretty much first class players there. Um, again, with the interfaces, this is, this is our object state um, and the context that the object is in. So for instance, you know, this, uh, this interface for department will have uh, the company inside of it, or this interface for the employee will have the department inside of it, because that's generally how we have to uh, go about addressing these. Uh, this right here uh, is almost a complete model. We have one more slide right here, which is to say our root query. Um, so this is the, how would you say, the, the entry point to our graph. Um, we, we instantiate a node, uh, and then we say on that node what we want available. These are literally names. If I, if I instead named this companies foo, then you'd have to go companies foo uh, as, as we're querying it. But because it's companies here, we can just go companies and we'll relate it directly to this QL connection, um, which I'll talk a little bit about once we actually do the query. Um, but that is referencing how we connect the nodes of the graph. Um, so there's, there's an idea of, of nodes and uh, vertices uh, that, that connect them, sort of like if you imagine like a circle, then a line, then a circle, right? That would be like two nodes and a, and a vertex in between, or an edge uh, in, in GraphQL parlance. Um, so that's, that's saying that we have an edge, we can aggregate on those, uh, sort of a little bit more complicated. Um, okay, this is a basic, uh, idea of, of what it's like to create the schema in GraphQL, what it's like to create the schema for the database. Um, we're getting, we're making a lot of headway on this. Uh, is there any questions at all? Uh, happy to stop for questions if anybody's got them. Not yet. All right. Man, we're blitzing through this. Okay, I think I might have to add a couple more slides to hit that 45 minutes. We're also respecting your Python format since it'll be the talk and then questions after. Oh gosh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, disregard me. Uh, cool. So to add this into our app to to open an endpoint uh, that somebody can send a, a formatted GraphQL request to, uh, we're just going to you know create a little Flask app. We're going to slap this uh, GraphQL view. Um, onto one of the, uh, the, the URL rules. And uh, we're gonna say, hey, here's the schema and call it a day. Uh, pretty simple there. So live demo time, this is where things get interesting. Okay. Um, all right, so to our left, uh, we have Insomnia. This is just uh, a really great, uh, freemium package uh, to query GraphQL with. Um, you can also use Postman, you can send it through curl, you can do whatever you want, but uh, this, this has really great support, syntax highlighting. And the other thing that's really nice is it allows you to uh, explore the schema as well. Um, so I wanna go through that real quick first uh, to show how GraphQL is self-documenting and, and verbose. So going into the schema, we'll go show documentation. Uh, this will be available in every single GraphQL client. Um, whenever you connect, they do reflection uh, for, the, for the schema. So we come in, we have companies, we have departments, we have employees, we have node. 
So let's start with companies. So I had mentioned that we have a connection. So we go companies as our top node. We go to a connection and edge, and then we have a company QL. We can grab some other things from there. We can see the name of the company. We can see the departments that that company has. Let's uh, say we want to look at the departments. We can go to a connection, an edge, and then we are at the department. Uh, the department has companies and employees, or I'm sorry, the, the department is connected to a company rather, um, and the department contains many employees. Uh, you might be asking yourself, what the heck's up with the, uh, the connections and the edges? Um, this is a way of running aggregations. Um, so if we look over here, uh, this really clearly describes the hierarchy of our data, right? We start companies, we go departments, we end employees. Um, say we wanted to figure out how many departments were in each company, uh, that would be at this edges node. We'd say, you know, I don't know, count departments. If, uh, if, if we had that attribute and resolver. Uh, we don't right now uh, for simplicity, but that's why it's there. Uh, and then the node brings us to the actual instance of a department. So uh, let's see what this looks like to create a query from scratch. So query, PyCon query. So we know that we have companies we can start out with. And then we go ah, edges, we go node. And we got, ah, we got names, we got departments. It's all really easily discoverable. It's all very friendly to the people using your API. Um, I think this is a great use case for, uh, for public APIs. Um, so, you know, kind of kind of interesting stuff. Why don't we go come here and go employees? James node name. Cool. All right, so let's run this query right now. We have a whole bunch of data in here, which I'll show us. Cool, so uh, just to get this started, it's all sort of fake data. Uh, we have 100 companies, we have 200 departments, and we have 10,000 employees. Uh, so it's quite a lot. <clears throat> we can see that we're able to return all of that uh, structured and formatted in JSON uh, in 350 kilobytes and half a second. Um, I'd say that's pretty good. Uh, one of the niceties too of um, Insomnia is that it gives you good ability to uh, compress these or uh, collapse them rather. Uh, so you can sort of explore it at your risk or at your, uh, at your leisure rather. All right, so that seems awesome. No big deals. I think it's a uh, win, 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 win. Um, except of course, this is called GraphQL, the devil's API. Uh, so there, there has to be a catch. Uh, the catch is that this is on a local database uh, with a local server. Um, so there's absolutely no latency in any of our network requests, right? We aren't, we aren't making any network requests except for one from here to the server and back. So we're gonna add a little bit of latency in here. And to show you, uh, this is how we're injecting our latency. Um, we're just sort of monkey patching it in there. Uh, and we are adding uh, doo -doo -doo, one one thousandth of a second to each query back and forth to the database. Um, that is super fast. I'll say, let's see, doo -doo, what is my ping to Google right now? And I don't think it's going to be one one thousandth of a second. Eh, five milliseconds, not too far off. So assuming this is a pretty good uh, amount of latency uh, for a, a server center, uh, let's go ahead and query again and see how we're doing. Yeah, it's not looking so good. That's, that's two and a half seconds for a very basic query. Um, in practice, uh, it only goes up from here. Uh, these queries get very complex, uh, especially as you start to power big dashboards. 
um, and performance becomes a massive issue, uh, sort of like a, like a snake eating their own tail kind of thing. It's just constant performance improvements, constant performance improvements. So uh, let's go ahead back to our presentation. So that latency though. Uh, the, the, the latency is caused by GraphQL's inherent ladder structure of context. So as we're going, as we're climbing up the ladder, right? We're starting at company as sort of our, our, our statewide context, if you imagine our global context. Uh, within companies, we're looking at departments, right? So, so for each of our hundred companies, each one of those has 20 departments. But uh, when we're looking at the departments for company A, we don't have any idea of the departments of company B. Um, and we need to make those requests at, uh, you know, come through before the, the next step of the ladder, the next rung of the ladder can be climbed, right? So we say, hey, grab all the companies, uh, which is great. The, the, the top level queries are easy peasy, one query. Um, but then the second level of query, we get the dreaded N plus one. Uh, so that means that you get one query for the top level and you get N queries for the second level, right? So again, we were saying there's a hundred companies. Uh, so you'd have one query for the company and then you'd have a hundred queries in, after that, uh, one per company for departments. So that would lead to 101 queries, N plus one. That uh, what, what it kind of looks like in Python, uh, what GraphQL is doing at each step is it's saying, here's our companies. For company and companies, look up our departments. For department and departments, look up our employees. Um, I, I, don't, I don't even think somebody, somebody learning how to program at a high school would think that this is a reasonable idea. This is like a, a lot. That's really a lot of, uh, a lot of sessions that you're, you're popping. Um, and it's a lot of network requests that you're using. So once, again, once these queries start getting really big, you start sending a lot of data over the wire um, and everything grinds to a halt. As mentioned before, uh, if we had one company with 10 departments, that's, and, uh, and 100 employees rather, uh, that's 12 DB queries, not too bad. You have one for the company, you have 10 for the departments, and then inside of that departments, you'll have uh, one, one per department uh, for each of the employees. Oh, which is actually not 12. <laughs> uh, if we have 100 companies, each with 10 departments, and each department with 100 employees, we actually end up creating 1,101 queries, uh, which, is, which is too many. But fear not. Uh, we, we've learned to love the data loader and the data loader can get us out of this. It's just a little bit of extra, a uh, little bit extra programming, um, and a little bit of extra complication. But what it's going to allow us to do is batch all of the, uh, all of each rung of the ladder and run all of the queries all at once. So they are foundationally based off of promises. Um, promises are going to allow us to uh, add asyncs to our process. Uh, it's going to make our processes asynchronous. Um, and the best way to think of them is sort of like a generator, right? Like we're going to say, you know, if you say for, for I in range 10 you know, or, or X for X in range 10, right? That's, that's going to create a generator um, expression that, that gets returned. And it's only going to evaluate once you try and see uh, the, the value of an object. Um, so similarly, a promise uh, is, is or rather a, a data loader is going to go through um, the following format. Uh, our, our resolver is going to request an object. The resolver queries the data loader for an object. The data loader is going to return uh, promises or a list of promises. Um, and then at, uh, at the time when those objects are, are being evaluated, um, all of the promises will be uh, instantiated, I suppose, or, or evaluated at the same time. Here's, a, here's what promises look like. Um, 
they're they're real kind of strange. Um, a, a promise has to take uh, two functions. It has to take a resolver and a rejector. Um, and basically, you can just assign a value to it and, and see if it's fulfilled and grab that value off of it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of unclear. They're, they're not super well documented, um, but they are all here on GitHub. And uh, my, my goal is to learn a little bit more about them. The good part is though, is that you don't have to have intimate knowledge of these promises to be able to make data loaders. So let's finally look at a data loader. Um, here's what they look like. We're, we're going to create a class that subclasses off of the promises data loader package or, uh, or class rather. Um, and we're gonna have a batch load function in there. That batch load function is gonna accept a list of some object, it can accept really anything. Uh, I think the best thing to send there is really IDs uh, for what you want. So in this uh, department data loader, we're gonna send company IDs and we wanna load departments from those company IDs. Uh, we can do that with a quick uh, query and we'll load that across all the companies. Um, the one caveat there is that this company IDs is an unsorted list. Um, so it's coming in just how it was created. Um, and the results need to be sent back. The, the, the promises need to be resolved in the same order uh, that the list was sent in. Um, so this is, this is one of the real finer points. If you don't send it back in the same order, uh, it'll just return random values uh, to the different parts. And that's, that's very difficult to debug. Um, so uh, a, a method that I've seen that's, that's most effective is tossing all of this into dictionaries and then uh, unpacking the dictionary by the list that was sent in. So that's just right here, some, uh, some, some list comprehension uh, to unpack the dictionary. Okay, so let's see our data loader gains. We're gonna come over here uh, and very sneakily, uh, I have included a little bit of code here to be able to enable our data loaders. Um, one other thing that I wanna show uh, is the data loader and the resolver. Um, so this is where mainly uh, the, the promises get held. Um, we have we have our classic, you know, uh, schema right here, or, or GraphQL schema. Um, employees was available uh, from the SQL Alchemy object type, and it would it would work if we if we didn't say that it, it's it's a, a custom attribute. Um, but we're going to overwrite that so that we can actually use our data loader here. Um, and all we do is say data loader dot load and we send it whatever ID we want. Um, as you'll notice, we're sending it an, an individual ID here, like a single ID. Um, but at the batch, uh, the batch load function, these are going to be expecting a list of IDs. So company IDs, department IDs. Um, that's a little bit of the magic of the data loader class. So let's look at, uh, let's look at where we are now. So we're going from 2.5 seconds down to, again, half a second and half a second reliably. And we have the exact same uh, format of query also. It's completely invisible to the, uh, to the end user. Um, yeah, that is, a, that is what a data loader looks like. And I'd like to do one more thing as well, which is to show you, um, show you how, uh, or to show you specifically, uh, using uh, echo on our um, on our queries, how many queries get sent? So, in this uh, in this query right here, we'll kick off. We get a ton. It's like so many. Um, if we turn off that active debugging, we can see we're at you know. 100 uh, per resolver and, and you know, many more uh, by, by company and employees. 
Um, so it's really a lot. It, it's it's a lot of uh, a lot of requests uh, uh, and a lot of wasted network cycles back and forth. I would uh, I would recommend not using that. So coming back over here. Uh, that will conclude our presentation for today. Uh, we saw some mad gains. We, uh, we reduced our, our query time um, by, let's see, I don't know, a factor of four, factor of five, something like that. I think that was pretty good. Uh, and we're replicating what you'd see in production if you're using a, a remote database. Um, we have a, a fabulous self-documented API for our end users to enjoy and uh, a new technological marvel for, uh, for, for you to, uh, <laughs> to obsess and rip your hair out over. <laughs> um, cool, so I'd like to, uh, I'd like to open up the, the floor for questions now, um, yeah. if anybody has any questions. We definitely have two questions queued up already. I'm sure more can come in. Yeah. Uh, one of them is, uh, how does pagination work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there is pagination, so these uh, let's see. these have cursors. Uh, yeah, see, so they have they have this first, before, and after. Um, so you can set up pagination in that way. Um, in my experience at work, we have really large requests. Uh, we've not gotten to a place where we find pagination to be necessary yet. Um, but we also have fairly static uh, dashboards and stuff instead of sort of like an infinite scroll. Um, but but that, that, that's where pagination is, uh, is used and it's, it's first party straight from GraphQL or, or GraphQL, I suppose. How do you get company information from the employee? Like uh, we didn't interrupt you earlier because we wanted to keep the flow more like PyCon. Uh, but when you were showing that graph in the ladder, um, how would you give the information from the employee, like not going top to bottom, but from bottom to top? Right. Uh, yeah. So we, we can do that. Let's let's go through. So query. Let's look at our let's look at our docs. Oh no, that's not good. Uh, there you go. Show docs. So if we go all the way back, uh, we started our root query. So we want to go from employees. Uh, doo -doo. And we can go up to department and department, we can go up to company. So let's see what that looks like. Oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. Um, GraphQL queries, uh, despite being backed by, uh, by Python, are all in camel case, like JavaScript. Um, so just be aware of that little, little weirdness uh, coming from the Python world. Um, so let's start with employees, which is code name. Oh, and one other thing I'd like to show too is what IDs look like. So here we are, we can, we can get uh, employees top level. Um, and you'll notice these IDs are these weird sort of like base 64 things, these base 64 encoded strings. Um, this is actually, yeah, 64 decode. Oh, okay, so this actually uh, can be decoded by the front end to determine the ID and the model that the row is from. Uh, so they don't necessarily need to keep the context of the ladder. They can just grab individual pieces, makes it a lot easier to traverse and to uh, get meaningful information out of there. So uh, continuing, so we go employees, we're gonna go department, And then we're gonna go company. And just like that, we have completely reversed the ladder. Um, because this is a, a graph structure, it doesn't matter which direction you go, um, as long as 
the root node you want is accessible uh, from that top level. Uh, you can go in any direction you want. Um, but, but as you can see, it, it gives a lot of flexibility uh, to, to the user to be able to explore this data and, and to gather it in a way that, that makes sense to them. Um, but the other thing you can see is that by traversing this in a different way, our response times went up again. Um, that's because we made data loaders for that sort of one access pattern, uh, but we don't have data loaders for the other access pattern. So we, we don't have data loaders to go from employees to departments. Um, so we're still, we're still firing off, you know, many, many thousands of, uh, of requests. You know, you can see, let me hit the resolver at least a hundred times. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Does that, uh, does that answer the question? I think so. Uh, Monty has a question now. Hi, R Ryan, th thanks for the talk. Um, uh, can graphing, can you use graphing to implement uh, GraphQL mutations as, as well as queries? Oh my gosh, we got a GraphQL expert over here. Um, yes, uh, that is actually, that's actually something I specifically uh, didn't want to get too much into. Um, I, I think mutations are a real weak point of GraphQL. Um, I, I don't like that there is a lot of uh, flexibility and ambiguity in your um, create and update requests. Uh, I, I think that makes for really messy backends. Um, but uh, the, the, the short answer is yes. Yes, it, it absolutely supports it. It's a, it's a first class party uh, inside of the package. Th thanks. And I think Hal has a question too. Uh, I can read that or go ahead and unmute Hal and ask you yeah. something. Yeah, um, isn't a data loader kind of acting as a cache? Is that how it's getting the speed up? And if so, how do you deal with the invalidation of the cache when your backend data changes? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so actually at work, we have combined um, a data loader and a cache. It's sort of an obvious place to combine them, right? Because you have these, these sort of unique keys that are getting sent in uh, and you have values that are associated with the unique keys which are getting sent out, right? So it's sort of, uh, it's, it's an easy place to cache. Um, but the, the, the way we were looking at it uh, in this presentation uh, is actually not cached. Um, the, the only speed up is brought by using async to reduce the total query count. Um, so a, as an idea, we're, we can look here in resolvers um, and then I'll go ahead and uh, enable our data loaders. Go back up here. So previously we would have seen these, well, uh, let, me, let me put this to false. So uh, right now, uh, while data loaders are disabled, uh, we're going to run the query from the resolver, just, uh, just accessing the attribute of the instance. So accessing the employee's attribute of the department instance, that'll use, that, that'll, um, uh, how do you say, a side effect of that is that SQL Alchemy will create a, a, a request to the database um, for those employees. Um, it, it'll create a query. So we can see, you know, that's, that's gonna create a hundred queries right here. If we instead elect to use data loaders, um, we still have the little logging to show when we go into, uh, into these resolvers, but the, the query itself is done inside of the data loader. And we'll see that the data loader itself only gets hit once. So the, the data loader is actually aggregating the, the key that we'd be searching for over these hundred queries, and it's doing it all in one query. Um, that's where that's where all of the gains are coming from. Uh, any caching you would do would would help subsequent queries. Um, and th these queries are in in production fairly static. Um, you know, you're, you're going to get a lot of the same query over and over and over again. You know, the the, the one to to power your main dashboard that one's going to be coming in all the time. Um, so in that case, query or um, caching would actually. Even, even speed this up more. It, I think I got that as a follow-up. Um, the downside of that is if I'm only looking for a specific employee, I'm mm -hmm. still 
reading in all the departments and all the companies. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, it is overall very wasteful um, if you're trying to only look for one person. Uh, you, you can add uh, search on these. Um, I, I didn't add search on these here, but as an idea, you know, you, you would say you know name equals or, equals foo or something. Mm, double quotes. There we go. So that, that's like, uh, that would be an idea of, of how you would search in GraphQL if, uh, if you had these search parameters set up inside of your schema. Um, we don't right now, uh, but yes, your, your intuition is correct. It is, it is a lot of queries to get to one, <laughs> one employee. So that, that's why I'd really recommend if you end up using this in production, I, I think a hybrid approach of having some RESTful APIs and some GraphQL APIs uh, make a lot of sense. Next question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for the talk. Um, do you have any tips or thoughts on like design patterns around um, building out the schema for a GraphQL API versus like a relational database or a NoSQL one? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh... So, it, so it, the, the, the GraphQL layer is sort of like resting on top of what the actual data representation is. Okay, my my misunderstanding. I see. So it's basically just changing how you're how you're querying and saying instead of having to write all the SQL, having to um, do that, you just write these these graph queries. Then. Yes and no. Um, so so these graph queries specifically are are utilizing the model. That we have so so our model. If we look here, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, bah, 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 bah. If we look at our models here. Um, we can see that like these models are the direct representation in Python mm -hmm. of whatever is in the database. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like that's one level of abstraction. Um, th this is inherent in your your ORM or your object relational yep. map. Um, the next abstraction is from your ORM to GraphQL, and that um, that's always in this fashion. Uh, it doesn't have to link directly to a model if if your ORM is not supported. Um, you can do this sort of more manually. You know, just kind of get rid of this meta class, and this would be a, a GraphQL or, a gra or a graphing model instead. Mm -hmm. No, I don't really recall right now. Um, but yeah, the, the, the levels of abstraction sort of make the underlying data uh, management platform sort of uh, it completely obfuscates it. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, I, I, I've yet to see anybody actually have a graph database for, uh, for GraphQL, which I think is pretty funny. That's just as a side note. <laughs> I think Richard's next in line for questions. Oh, okay. I was I was just curious if you can have multiple uh, schemas at the same time. That is, so that you can optimize queries in different different uh, ways. Yes, uh, that's that's actually a great question. Um, so our nodes in the schema, right? Like this one has a, a company QL. Say we wanted to look for like a. a specific employee, right? And, and we think the user knows the company, the department, and the employee ID or something like that. We, we could have, you know, company, department, whatever ID uh, as its own node. We, we, we can create sort of one-off nodes for, uh, for performance. And that, that is something that I've, uh, I've done um, for work as well uh, in, in our sort of production cluster. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah, that was a that was a great question. I think uh, I think you have a deep understanding of where this is uh, where 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 this is headed. Well, I've I've worked with it in in uh, production, so I, but I just don't remember very much of it right now. Oh, cool. Okay, right on. I think Sush uh, Sushant has a question about uh, can we build the query at runtime? Build the query at runtime. It's a yeah. Um, that would be sort of more on the, the JavaScript side, which 
to be totally honest, is uh, is a real weak point of mine. Um, they can be dynamically created, uh, absolutely, uh, so long as they so long as they follow what the uh, the, the structure of the schema is. Um, anything goes. You know, we we could even keep keep going down this hole and and just make this circular. <laughs> just keep going and keep going and keep going. Cool. Um, Narav, do you want to read the next question? Um, is a GraphQL, will it be part of a Flask server or will it require different uh, a server? As I was starting to read about it and I came across uh, with instructions to have a Apollo server of GraphQL. Oh, okay. So the, the Apollo server of GraphQL, that's the front end side. Um, Apollo is the, is the JavaScript sort of like the, the caller. Um, the receiver, the backend side, uh, it doesn't matter what server it's on. Uh, you could totally run this on Tornado. You can run it on anything. A anything that you can open an endpoint up to, uh, you can just toss that, that schema on. So we can see here, uh, boom, right here, this is our URL rule. Um, so anything that you can send this, this GraphQL view, dot as view, um, you're, you're good to go. Cool. Yeah, Flask is just, uh, you know, it was just like three lines. So <laughs> always nice for, uh, for demonstration purposes. Are there any, any other questions? Uh, 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 Ryan, um, yeah. since, uh, you know, this was a PyCon preparatory talk, would you be open to a couple of minor suggestions about the talk to improve it for PyCon? Oh my gosh, I would absolutely welcome them. Please, anything uh, anything would be very helpful. Okay, two, just two little things. One, at the beginning, just be very explicit that you're talking about making a GraphQL server rather than the, a GraphQL client. Ah. I was I was a little confused about that. You you you, you know when 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 you start implementing it. And uh, and then and then the, the the other little suggestion would be since GraphQL is kind of new to people, I think it would be help if you gave a, a little example of a of a GraphQL client in Python. You know, just a little Python program that makes a GraphQL query. I've I've used the request package to do that, and it's really easy. But but I think it would it would make things a lot more concrete. Uh, okay. I think uh, yeah. I think that's super helpful. I, I also want to get. Um, I think. Uh, I, I think reordering a little bit too to start off with actually querying GraphQL to show people structure why we're doing it. Um, I, I think showing that concretely earlier uh, would would also be more helpful. So that's uh, <laughs> all the niceties of of having a few practice presentations. I I agree with what you just said. <laughs> So uh, I have a question. Um, this is so I for GraphQL. Well, maybe I'll give you some context. So when I I was uh, I don't know about six months ago, I was trying to get some data out of Cloudflare and for some analytics, and they have a GraphQL API, and I found it very painful uh, for that kind of application. So I guess I was wondering. Are there some, you know, like redeeming features when you're building UIs on top of this, like pre-built components or something that would make this like, um, you know, like really great to use versus a, a REST API for UI stuff? Yeah, I think the killer feature um, for, the, for the front end folks is reusability. Um, so what we can do is we can actually, we can chop this up into like fragments. Um, oh, I, I have to look that up. Um, so we, we can actually uh, break break these parts off um, in, into their individual components and and just reference those by a variable in this query, uh, which makes makes it really simple to to break down these these much larger queries into individual components, and then those components can be reused all over the place. Um, it's, it's really nice for organization and, and sort of ties back to those OOP principles uh, that Eric was talking about. 
Okay, thanks. Where I think, uh, I, I guess, as, as a comparison, I, I think it's very difficult to do that um, with with REST because each endpoint is is by its nature sort of singular or, or not really able to be changed. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. Awesome. Well, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, I have a hi. This oh. is Karen. I I have another uh, quick question or yeah. su suggestion as you're uh, giving your talk that um, I think that uh, you you will have some people who are gonna have some uh, a lot of experience with GraphQL, and I think as people hear more about it um, uh, and also need to use it because as Jeff points out, there are places that have a GraphQL endpoint that you need to query moving from one kind of mindset to another. I think a, a, a tiny bit more time talking about the pluses and minuses of why you'd move to GraphQL and why that's important um, and nodes and edges because that's, I feel like that's very different um, from a REST API, as you said, if you're coming from that mindset, a REST a, a REST um, endpoint is pretty clear. You provide these parameters and you get this kind of output versus GraphQL where it feels like you have, maybe you have, you can have a variety of questions you're asking and a variety of outputs. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's the way it appears to me. And so there, it, like nodes and edges are a different language than you use in REST API world. So some of the people that you're going to your talk will, are going to be learning about GraphQL QL, so they'll want to know why are you using GraphQL? And what are some of these additional words that you're using? Um, I, I think that would help them uh, be introduced to your talk a little bit better. Yeah, that's that's fantastic feedback. I totally agree. Um, I I was kind of realizing as I was walking through the nodes and edges, I was like, oh my god, I don't have a picture. Why don't I have a picture? <laughs> so <laughs> I think that would, that would that would help to clear up those. Uh, those mental uh, mental images a lot. Yeah, Thank and you. I think, uh, and just one more is like, when you're talking about optimization, just those things at the end, it's always nice to tell them what you're gonna tell them and then tell them what you told them at the end. So have like a few little, maybe a, se a separate slides to hear some things that we did to optimize pain points and how we addressed it to solve it at the end, especially for folks who are trying to grok everything that you've got you speak very clearly you, it's fun talk you have fun examples but um just they're trying to hold a lot in their head and to give them a final slide that gives them tells them a little bit what they told them and maybe next steps awesome okay yeah that's a that's a great point gotta get that last slide in there thank you karen that's a, that's wonderful feedback great job thank you So I think Nirav had a question. Do you have this, um, okay, now my th screen sure. changed. Do you have this code base shared over GitHub or do you have a plan to share it? Like uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, keep an eye on my GitHub. I think it might already be there in public. Um, let me see if I can get a link for it. I guess we're, we're early, early viewers, so. <laughs> yeah, first place, this is, uh, y'all heard it here first. <laughs> it was just a world premiere of your tour, huh? I love it. Yeah, Pre -pre -premier. world premiere. Okay, uh, let's see here. I'm going to toss it in chat. And uh, thank you. I, I, I too hope I have good luck at my talk. <laughs> I'm very yeah, excited, everybody. This is my first time there. Plus one. Good luck. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions? Well, uh, before uh, before I completely wrap up, thank you, Jeff, for for giving me place to uh, to iron out my my uh, my PyCon talk, and thank you everybody for your uh, for your wonderful feedback. And we're happy to do it, and we're we're happy that uh, uh, that you made made it to PyCon. That's a big accomplishment. Be world famous. Oh my <laughs> God. Me and Guido are going to be getting drinks on the roof. That's great.
And I, I was just thinking kind of architecturally, like the differences between the GraphQL and this, I mean, the difference between this and uh, using a REST API in terms of interacting with other companies. So another company is going to use this REST API or GraphQL API to extract data. And what are the implications for that other company in terms of how it's going to get that data using this API versus using another REST API? And, and what do you have to know to do that? Because I'm always dealing with this in terms of, of data extraction. Right, right. Yeah, I, I just think it's um, it, it's sort of a six of one, half dozen of the other, right? If, if you need flexibility, this is your, this is your thing. You, you really want GraphQL. Um, especially if you're powering, uh, I think dashboards are a really good use case for this, right? Like you're getting a lot of data, uh, you're showing a lot of data points. You're not really doing a ton of filtering besides the context of, of where things are. Um, GraphQL is great. A, in the use case of, you know, you're trying to find one employee quickly, it is absolutely the wrong tool. Um, and it's, it's not going to be a good use case for that. Actually, if folks want to see how that works out in practice, the GitHub API is implemented both as Rust and as GraphQL. Ooh. And they haven't been entirely consistent on which attributes are available where. Some are available in both formats. Others, you have to use a specific one. Uh, so it's an interesting way to observe how something kind of organically appeared over time. And, uh, and also- I think they have a justification somewhere on their site about that as well. So I recently had to look at that because I need to do some juggling. <laughs> oh yeah, um, Nirav, so GraphQL on top of Elasticsearch should be totally fine. Um, you know, if, if I recall, Elasticsearch generally responds to queries with, um, with JSON. Um, so you, you'd sort of need like an intermediary layer to, to hide. Um, it, it, there's a bit of a, like a um, security aspect that, that GraphQL handles too, um, that, that we didn't really go over, which is that it, it is a representation of your data, but it's not a direct access of your data. Um, so we, we do have to create that, that intermediary schema, which allows people to do things, you know, to, to, to request data in, in specific ways, but it, it doesn't allow them to send raw queries. Um, so ostensibly the user wouldn't know that Elasticsearch is, is what's powering your GraphQL API. Um, you would need to do uh, certain aggregations um, in your GraphQL schema to be able to represent the response from Elasticsearch uh, in your in your GraphQL API. That's great help. That's that's terrific. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. But is that all the questions? Man, th thank you all so much for the questions. This